Hi, my name is Colleen Picorni and I'm a Collections Assistant at the Goldstein Museum of Design. This video is going to highlight menswear garments that are representative of the Peacock Revolution from the late 1960s and early 1970s. Prior to the 1960s, menswear was generally conservative and followed the same general template decade after decade. It was slow changing in terms of details and also tended to be in darker colored tones such as blue, gray, and blacks. The groundwork for the Peacock Revolution began in the 1950s in London. It grew out of London mod fashions from Carnaby Street, and there was increased interest in menswear and fashion that was based in youth movements of the baby boomer generation. Young men began to challenge traditional views of masculinity from the Victorian era. They pushed back on traditional gender roles through their sartorial choices, and they began to wear things that had previously been seen as too feminine, such as tighter fitting silhouettes, frills, chiffons, bright colors, and bold prints. The Peacock Revolution allowed men to express their personality and masculinity in new ways. It gave men access to a greater variety of styling than in previous decades, and it started to push the boundaries of gender norms and clothing. In this video, I'll be showing you a formal wear ensemble consisting of a tuxedo jacket and pants, a dress shirt, and shoes. I'm also going to feature another fun pair of platform shoes that are just really uh, exciting and representative of fashion in the 1960s and 70s. This tuxedo consists of a velvet dinner jacket and black pants and it's dated from 1968 to 1969. The tuxedo was purchased from a clothing store in downtown Minneapolis and it's made by a brand called After Six. After Six was a large men's formal wear brand that pioneered colored suiting and rental suits for middle class men in America during the 1960s and 1970s. And this brand helped make styles from the Peacock Revolution accessible to average Americans. This tuxedo is not the most extreme example of suiting at this time, but it does represent this more accessible version of the Peacock Revolution that would be found in the Midwest. The tuxedo highlights the overall silhouette of men's suiting at this time, which was a lean and tall silhouette. Jackets were slimmer fitting with nipped in waists and wide lapels, and pants were tighter fitting through the hips and thighs and then flared out at the hem. So let's start by examining this dinner jacket up close. In terms of construction and details, this suit follows most of the traditional tailoring techniques of past decades, but what really sets it apart is the materials, the colors, the pattern, and the proportion of the suit. So we'll start with the materials. So this is made from a cotton velveteen, and then the lapel is from a black velvet. And in a traditional tuxedo suit, this lapel would have been black satin instead of black velvet. Patterned velvet jackets were really popular in the 60s and 70s and represented this shift away um, from more traditional styling towards bolder styling for men and also a more informal suiting styling. Paisley prints, uh, this one's in a nice burgundy color, uh, were really common in the 60s and 70s due to increased interest in patterns from other cultures, especially India and Eastern cultures. And Paisley print added a level of richness and flamboyance to this jacket. So this paisley print and also the velvet would not have been traditional suiting materials in previous decades. So we're gonna go back up and look at the lapel. So this is a peak lapel, and you'll notice that it is quite wide. And a common detail in the 60s and 70s uh, is that lapels continue to widen often to some sort of outlandish proportions. We're gonna flip this back so you can see the body velvet continues under the lapel here. But then we go up to the under collar, and notice that this is a felt fabric, and that's a traditional material that would be found on the under collar of men's suiting. So that does follow tradition. This suit does also have really traditional pocket styling, so it has a single welt pocket here on the chest, as well as flap pockets down on the waist. So there's a pocket here, and then the other flap pocket here. This is a single breasted style with a single button. And this is a little bit of a change from past decades. Uh, traditional tuxedo suits probably would have been double breasted prior to this. The other big change is in terms of shaping. So you can see here along the side seam that this waist is quite shaped. It is not a boxy silhouette and it is nipped in here at the waist. So that represents uh, a major change in men's suiting during the Peacock Revolution to having a more shaped and tightly fitted suit move on to our sleeve and here is our sleeve placket so on this suit uh, because it is more of a mass commercial produced suit this is a faux sleeve placket these buttons do not actually function you see we can't actually open up this 
So like I said, that's more of a mass-produced version, and it's also a little bit more of informal styling to have a non-functional sleeve placket. Let's open this up now. So on the interior, you'll see that this has been lined in a synthetic, most likely a polyester. It does have a lot of the same traditional suiting details. So we have interior chest pockets as well as the label for the suit, one on each side, and then a traditional back vent. So now we're gonna look at the tuxedo pants. And similar to the tuxedo jacket, there are elements of these pants which are more traditional, especially in terms of style, details, and construction, and elements which are more reflective of the peacock revolution in terms of pushing gender boundaries. So let's talk about the details on these pants that are traditional. You'll see down the outseam that we have a traditional satin stripe for a tuxedo. The fly closure is also very traditional, so we have a tab closure with a hook and slider, metal zipper, and then an interior button to keep the fly in place. Uh, now since tuxedo pants would not have been worn with a belt, we have some traditional details in order to keep the waist tight. So you've got a tab and button closure on the side. So you would have adjusted this tab to these other buttons in order to take in the waist. You also could have worn these pants with suspenders. So you have buttons here on the front. And if I flip these over, you'll see buttons on the back. And that would have allowed you to have worn these pants with suspenders to keep them up. However, since uh, this suit would have most likely been worn with a much more frilly and flamboyant shirt, it's unlikely that you would have worn suspenders with this specific suit. You also see on the back that we have very traditional double welt back pockets. So what's different about these pants than uh, men's suiting in previous decades is really the shaping. Uh, so these are flat front pants. They do not have any additional pleats on the front or back to add fullness. They're also way a lot more shaped than traditional menswear pants. You can see that there's a lot of shaping here around the hip and the thigh. It comes in narrow here at the knee and then proceeds to really flare out here at the hem. And traditional menswear pants prior to this would have been cut very straight, a little bit more baggy with extra fabric. And these pants instead would have been a little bit more tighter fitting, especially through the upper part of the body, through the knee, and then accentuating down at the hip with a wide hem, uh, which is a common style detail that we see in the 1960s and 70s. Now we're gonna look at a tuxedo shirt that could have been worn with the suit previously shown. Tuxedo shirts and men's shirting during the Peacock Revolution also gained more of these feminine details, such as ruffles, tucks, frills, bold patterns, prints, and colors. This tuxedo dress shirt dates between 1970 and 1979. And again, there are features here that are more traditional and some that reflect pushback against traditional gender norms in menswear. So we'll start with the fabrication. So this is white, which is very traditional. Uh, what is different though is the actual fabric itself. So this is a 65 polyester 35 cotton blend. And polyester was really growing in popularity since the 1950s because it was perceived to be more easy to care and had better wearability and lower cost. And in the past, men's shirts would have been most likely 100% cotton or 100% linen. The shaping of this shirt is also very untraditional. It has a lot of shaping along the waist. You can see here, very shaped waist down through the hem as opposed to a more boxy cut that would have been in previous decades. Uh, so this again is a more feminine style to have a shaped waist. It also fits better underneath the slimmer cut jackets during the Peacock Revolution. And it helped to create that long lean silhouette that was desired by menswear during the Peacock Revolution. Um, this shirt also would have been um, more tight fitting in general with a lot less room for movement than menswear in previous decades. Let's talk about the details of this shirt. So first, starting with the collar, you notice that it is very long and very pointy. So as lapels got much larger on jackets, collars also got much larger to go along with them. So this one comes out and extends very far down and its shaping is kept through a collar stay inside of the collar and that keeps it nice and crisp and pointy. Okay, now I think we need to address these ruffles on the bib. So tuxedo shirts, traditionally would have had a series of pleats or tucks uh, on the bib. Instead here, due to the Peacock Revolution and adding more feminine detailing, we have a series of ruffles. And these ruffles are really emphasized uh, through a black zigzag stitch that goes along the edge of the ruffle. 
In terms of the closure for this shirt, the ruffles cleverly hide the hidden button placket. So here you can see the button placket. And you've got a ruffle set on top of it so that that visual element is not broken up across the shirt. And in a traditional tuxedo shirt, instead of a button placket, uh, this would have been closed with studs. So you would have just had buttonholes and you would have had tuxedo studs that would have held the shirt closed instead. And we will move on down to the sleeve. So here at the sleeve cuff, again, we have repeating ruffles edged in the same black zigzag stitch. See the full cuff there. And this is a single cuff and would have been held closed with a cuff link here. And then the end of this sleeve would have stuck out below the end of the hem of a jacket. So these ruffles would have been visible past your jacket sleeve to add a little bit more of feminine detailing in touch to the jacket and the suit overall. So all of these details in terms of the ruffles and the collar and this waist shaping here are all elements that were new to menswear during the Peacock Revolution and really challenged ideas of masculinity by adding more feminine detailing and pushing back against gender norm in menswear. So no outfit would be complete without shoes. So we need to talk about what kind of shoes would have been worn with the tuxedo ensemble in this video. Um, footwear was also impacted by the Peacock Revolution. And during the 60s and 70s, suits were worn with a heeled boot, like you see here, as opposed to a traditional men's dress shoe. These are a brown leather pull-on boot. Uh, they're made by Carville from Italy from 1965 to 1975. And while these are brown, uh, ideally the shoes that would go with the tuxedo in this video uh, would have been black. These are a variant of the Chelsea boot, but they have a taller uh, two inch Cuban heel. It's a chunky heel you can see here. And this style of boot is also known as the beetle boot. They were made popular by the Beatles during the 60s and 70s. And the heel on these is actually not that high. It seems high for menswear for us today. Uh, in the 60s and 70s, the height of men's boots and shoes uh, continue to go upwards. Uh, imagine videos of like Elton John and Jimi Hendrix and their much higher heeled boots. And to get into this boot, there is no zipper closure or actual uh, any sort of closure. It's made up through strips of leather that are attached to elastic. So this elastic will stretch when your foot goes into the boot. Um, and the height of this would extend up onto your calf a little bit. Uh, so it would create a nice, smooth, tight fit. And the height of boots and heeled boots and shoes became popular in the 60s and 70s, not only as a way to push against um, masculine detailing, but also as pants continued to flare out at the hem, you needed a taller boot in order to keep your pants from dragging on the floor and to maintain uh, proportions in your overall ensemble. I wanna show one more pair of menswear shoes from the Peacock Revolution. And these are one of my favorite items from the Goldstein collection. And they really highlight changing style for men during this time period. So these are platform shoes from 1972. And these shoes would not have been worn with the tuxedo that I've been showing in the rest of this video. These reflect more everyday um, wear shoes and would have been worn with flared pants or denim bell bottoms um, and a brightly colored polyester shirt. And it features three tones of brown leather in a curvilinear pattern, which really harkens back to pop art styling from this time period. It also has a very chunky heel and a rounded toe with a platform base. And again, this heel height, while higher than we've seen in previous decades of menswear, is not as high as platform shoes would get in the 1970s. Uh, shoes seen on pop stars would often be significantly higher than these shoes here. Uh, this pair is a more modest everyday version of the platform shoe. And platform shoes like this were a great complement to wide bell-bottom pants because they kept your cuffs from dragging on the ground and helped to balance out proportions of these flared pants. Thanks for watching. I hope you've enjoyed this feature on menswear during the Peacock Revolution in the 1960s and 1970s.